Hello everyone. So I'm going to present. I'm going to be presenting uh, my work on uh, differentiable simulators and why you should care about them, and in particular why they help with uh, Bayesian calibration of of models. So first, by a differentiable simulator, I mean any kind of computer program that you can represent as a function that goes from some input space R m to some output space R n, for which you can obtain in an easy and efficient way and correct way the derivative of the program with respect to the input parameters. So we all know from the uh, first year of undergrad how to compute the basic numerical differentiation of a computer program. Uh, one way to do it is we just take the basic definition of, of what the derivative is and compute this limit. But obviously this has some problems because it's often inaccurate, right? It, it, you have to choose a step size and it's not always ideal. And on top of that, it's very expensive to do, right? Because if you have a simulator that goes from Rm to Rn, you typically need to do n times n evaluations of your simulator, which may be very expensive. So this is not a very good way to compute the derivative. Another thing you can do is you can hard code into uh, your uh, programming language or whatever, a way to differentiate expressions like you get that like, like humans do. No? Like we hard code the derivative of the sine is the cosine, and then we automatically expand the function and the derivative in this way. And this is, for instance, what Mathematica or SimPy does. But even though this is an exact way of computer derivative, it's uh, terribly expensive, right? Because if you have a simulator with a million simulations, there's no way you can write an expression like that. So that's why in recent years, uh, powered by machine learning, there's been a lot, of, a lot of advancement on the field of automatic differentiation, which is a way to compute the derivative of a computer program that is exact and very fast. And the way it works is um, you basically, as you run your simulation forward, you store a computation graph that stores all the operations that happen inside the code. And then through back, you can backpropagate this graph. You can query it to quickly get derivatives of your program. And this has the advantage of being exact. And it also has the advantage that it's very fast. So it scales with roughly with the minimum of m and n, where m and n, m is the dimensionality of the input space and n is the um, the dimensionality of the output space. And there are roughly two ways to do it. One is uh, the forward remote automatic differentiation, in which if you run the computer for like the simulation forward, you're computing the derivative life, so you don't need to store the graph. And in reverse mode, you first run your simulation forward, you store the computation graph, and then you back propagate it in reverse mode. Now, forward mode scales with the input space, and reverse mode scales with the output space. So that's why, if you're familiar with machine learning, everyone uses reverse mode because typically neural networks have uh, m much larger than n, so you want to use the most efficient one. Um, now, in this talk, even though it's called differential simulators, I'm going to be focusing on a specific kind of simulator, which is an agent-based model. Now, agent-based models, as you know, is a form to simulate complex systems from the bottom up, but they often, suf often suffer from problems because they are very expensive to calibrate due to their complexity and high stochasticity, and sometimes the results are very hard to interpret or, or validate. So my question is, can we actually, uh, can, can agent-based models, ABMs, be made differentiable? And there are lots of unknowns here because, for instance, your program may have structures like an if and else statement and things like that, which is not clear how you make differentiable. It's also not clear how you make a stochastic program differentiable, let alone an ABM, which most of the time, it's intrinsically discrete, so you have lots of discrete sampling. Maybe when you run reverse mode automatic differentiation, the computation graph gets so big that you cannot fit into memory. Think about an epidemiological simulation, 100 million agents, billions of interactions, all of that will need to store, be stored in a graph, maybe it's too big. And maybe after all, you get something that, is a, that looks like a gradient, but it's completely useless, right? So I think, yes, they can, and uh, I will show you proof. Uh, that it can be done. So as a case study, I will focus on the June epidemiological model. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know what June is, June is a one-to-one -one epidemiological model of England. So we have 56 million agents. Um, the model, sorry, ah. the model was built using uh, the English census data. So it's very, very detailed. Uh, you have locations such as households, companies, schools, pubs that are all geolocalized. It's a very detailed model. And so this past year, I've been working on what I call Grad AVM June, which is the differentiable implementation of June written in PyTorch.
Okay, so PyTorch, for those you know, is a it's a it's a programming language about well, it's a it's a library in Python that implements automatic differentiation for you, but you could also use something like Jax or Julia to do the same thing. Now, because we because the model has to be implemented in PyTorch, um, it needs to be implemented in a tensorized way using PyTorch tensors, and that means that when 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 I when we, when we did that, uh, we basically implemented the model in a vectorized way. Uh, which was very easy to also run on GPUs and very fast. So we actually went from 50 hours of simulation time down to five seconds. And this is because of this tensorization. If you want to know more, you can, you can check the references there. But basically, the tensorization, tensorization approach enables the scal scalability of ABMs to millions, if not billions of agents. But then there's the part that I was actually interested in, which is the automatic differentiation. And by implementing June in PyTorch, now we get all the gradients of the outputs respect to the inputs in a very efficient way. And I will show now that uh, we were able to do a full Bayesian calibration of 8 million agents from 100,000 hours for the original model down to eight uh, on a supercomputer down to eight hours using commodity hardware. Um, so the way that this Bayesian calibration was done was uh, using something that's called variational inference. So for those of you who don't know, Bayesian inference is a way to frame Bayesian inference as an optimization problem. So imagine that you want to target a certain posterior, which is the black line. You assume that um, you can approximate the posterior by a family of distributions, which are parameterized by certain parameters. So in this case, uh, just as an example, I'm showing a normal distribution parameterized by two parameters. And then you design some optimization pipeline such that uh, optimizing a certain loss function is equivalent to finding the most, uh, the closer function to the posterior. Actually, use something different, which is a bit different, which is generalized variational inference, which is a generalization of a variational inference, in that instead of targeting the traditional Bayesian posterior, you target something that's called the generalized posterior. And if you also want some details, you can check uh, this, this recent paper. But the idea is the following. We assume some posterior estimator Q. Um, so in the example I showed in the GIF, that was uh, a normal distribution. But in general, we will have this to be quite a complicated family. Then we sample uh, parameters from this estimator. So this distribution, we sample some ABM parameters that we fit through the simulator. Then this generates some ABM output. So for instance, if this is June, this is basically a time series of deaths per day. Then we have some ground truth data. So we have a, a loss term, which we call the forecast loss. Uh, so it's the expectation of under Q of some uh, function that compares the ground truth with the simulated data. So if this L is the likelihood, then this is variational inference. But if this L is any other loss function, this is generalized variational inference. Um, then we have another term, which is the divergence terms, that compares the posterior estimator with some prior. So this is how we enforce that the estimator gets clo it stays closer to the prior. And the sum of these two terms is our loss function. And then we compute the gradient of this to update that. Okay. And you'll realize that to compute the gradient of this, we need to compute the gradient of this. So basically, we need to find a way to differentiate through the simulator, right? Or not. We'll see now. So in general, for variational inference, uh, we need to find gradients that look like this. It's a gradient of phi of some measure that depends, that's parameterized by phi, of a function f, which is the simulator. And there are typically two ways to obtain this gradient. So the first one is through derivatives of the measure, through derivatives of p. And that's known as score-based gradient, which is, for instance, what people in reinforcement learning do. Or the other way is through uh, the derivatives of f, which is called the pathwise gradient, which is differentiating the simulator itself. Now, typically, not in general, you can find edge cases, but typically the pathwise gradient has much lower variance than the score one. And that's why you actually care about having a differentiable simulator, potentially. So in this pattern I showed, now, um, I put here a differentiable simulator instead of a normal simulator, which means that this gradient is now a pathwise gradient. Now, as a choice of loss, I'll choose the L2 loss. So this is comparing, I'm going to be comparing the number of cases of my simulation with the ground truth data. Then as divergence, I just choose the standard KL divergence. And the only choice left is how do we choose this family of distributions? And I choose this a normalizing flow. And yesterday we had a very nice talk on normalizing flow, so I don't need to explain what they are. But just as a brief reminder, a normalizing flow is a way to, to um, describe a general distribution by a series of transformations that transform 
a simple standard distribution into a more complicated thing. And the beauty of it is that these FIs are defined in a certain way so that this process is easy to invert and easy to compute the determinants so you can transform um, the probability volumes. So my calibration experiment is made with, with June. So I have 8.2 million agents, I think. This is London. I have 10 free parameters that, calibrate, that measure how intense the contact is in each location. Uh, so uh, in households, companies, school, pubs, grocery shops, cinemas, gyms. Then I have one parameter that controls the seating. And then the experiment doesn't compare anything. So I haven't done it with, um, um, with real observed data. So basically what I do is I choose a value for these parameters. I generate some synthetic data and then I try to recover it, right? So it's very simple exercise, just trying to recover the simulated parameters. And the first issue, so when we set up the, um, so I set up the pipeline that I described, I set up the experiment, and then I found this issue that even with, either if I was using the score based gradient or the pathways gradient, the model did not train very well. So this is the loss function. It goes down, but not as much as you hoped. And it took us a while to figure out why it was, why, why was it? Is it because the gradients that you get are, are, are trash and they don't inform you anything or what is it? So actually we digged into the machine learning literature and this is a known problem, especially in the recurrent neural network field. So what's happening is the following. Imagine that you have an agent-based model that's producing a time series with four time steps. Now the first time step is a function of your input parameters theta. But the second time step is a function of your previous time step on, and, and, the avian, and, and the avian parameters as well, right? And you get how it goes. So the gradient of, let's say, the number of cases in day two respect to the AVM parameters depends directly on the AVM parameters for this partial derivative here, but also through the cases in the previous day, right? And you can see how, it, how this gets more complicated, right? So the third day depends on the third day, on, on the number of cases of first day, second day, whatever. And you know, if we have a time series with 100 days, you can see how this grows. So, what we found out is that actually these additional terms, these uh, kind of like auto-recursive auto -recursive terms, uh, you want to get rid of them. So um, this is showing, um, so this is, um, I don't have time to go into details, but this is the gradient respect to the flow, per, well, no, it's not the flow, but like the, think about it as the gradient of the um, um, outputs respect to the Q parameters. And you can see that for the score function estimator, the gradients have very high variance. And for this case in which I keep all the terms, so I keep all the terms of the derivative, then yes, the variance is lower as you would expect because this is a pathwise, but you still have a bit of variance here. But then when I get rid of these terms, actually the uh, variance goes way down. And the way to understand this is that when we get rid of these autoregressive terms, we're losing information because we're losing information of what happened in the past. But actually, these terms contribute a lot to the variance of the gradient estimation method. So actually, yes, when you truncate this series, you get a bit of bias, by, but the reduction on the variance is crucial to be able to train. And you can see it here now when I set the, the horizon to zero, which means I only keep the first partial derivative, the gradient, the 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 model trains very well. And I just want to show you a video on how it trains. So here you can see, um, this is just a, a demonstration. So this just shows three parameters, household, company, and school. So these are the, the contact intensity in these locations. The black line is the ground truth data of cases, and the blue line is the simulations run from the untrained flow. And here is the loss function. So as I train, the loss function is going down the flow and the blue ones are the true parameters. So then the flow is getting more confident around the true parameters and then it's quite satisfying when um, you know, it correctly simulates the data. This is a small experiment with three parameters. Here you have the one with 11 parameters, the trained flow, and the green ones are sampled from the prior. The orange one is the untrained flow. And then the blue one shows when we sample the parameters from the train flow and ran them through the emulator, it correctly recovers the ground truth data. And this was done with 8 million agents, simulating 60 time steps, uh, varying 11 parameters, and it took eight hours of fitting uh, using um, one GPU. 
So another thing that we get for free if we have a differentiable simulator, how much time do I have left, by the way? Oh, okay, I'm way ahead of time, okay. Um, another advantage that we have, and I want to emphasize this because, I mean, it's a bit obvious, but it's quite interesting, is that when we have a differentiable simulator, right, um, we can imagine that for June, we would have as output the number of cases and as input the number of parameters. But actually, um, if we use reverse mode differentiation, then we run the model once, we obtain the computation graph, and then we obtain for free, basically, all the gradients of the output respect to the inputs, which basically is the sensitivity, right? The gradients that tell you how sensitive uh, your output is respect to the parameters. So that means that, for instance, um, this is a very nice paper that was written about the COVID SIM epidemiological code, right? The, the famous imperial model. Um, and they ran a sensitivity analysis and they said, well, the model has 940 input parameters, but we have to restrict to 19 because otherwise it's too expensive. And, and, and even we, we, when we computed the sensitivity of these 19 parameters, we still had to run the model thousands of times. But now that we have a differentiable simulator, we don't care if this is 19 or 3,500 because reverse mode AD is completely independent of input, of input parameters. So we basically, we get the sensitivity analysis for free. And here I show like in this, um, um, in the feed I was showing before, this is showing the um, gradients of, uh, let's say I pick the number of cases at the last day and I say, what is the gradient of this respect to the input parameters? And it's shown here in log scale. So you can see that for instance, the the first one is the seed, so how many cases I seed, right? So this, the model will be quite sensitive, that's why the gradient is so high. The next one is the content intensity in households. The next one is in companies. And the lower ones is, for instance, at cinema, right? Because not many people go to the cinema, so actually this is, the model is not very sensitive to this parameter, and things like this. So in conclusion, if you have a differentiable simulator, if you have a differentiable agent model, model, you can run them very fast because of tensorization. They allow to, for fast and accurate Bayesian calibration because of the gradients, and then you also get a fast and accurate sensitivity analysis uh, through gradients. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Uh, any questions from the room? Thank you, very nice talk. Uh, maybe it's a stupid question, but um, have you tried, instead of um, uh, truncating the, the recursive derivative, just to say, okay, then my output is just the final num total final number of that, or something like that? So, um, so you don't have the problem of the recurrence and you just use that one point? Yeah, but if I use just the last point, right, and then I, so I, I run the simulation for 100 days, and then I obtain the deaths at the last day, right? and then I differentiate to the simulator, the problem is that it's gonna run the gradient from the beginning of the simulation towards the end. So then it's gonna run, it's gonna have all the terms. So what I'm doing is kind of like, instead of, if I have to simulate 100 days, instead of simulating a time series of 100 days, is equivalent to, I simulate one day and I compare it to data. I simulate a second day and I compare it to data. So I restart the model at every point. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Thanks, really nice talk. Um, I guess my question was more about the process of um, tensorizing uh, the original June model. So how how easy is that to do? And are there kind of, you know, are there software that uh, basically allows one to code up these things using GPUs relatively easily? Yeah, so, so if you implement it in JAX or, or PyTorch, you get it runs on GPUs for free, right? Because that's, that's how it's designed. In terms of how easy it is, I mean, it's, it's more an art than a science because you're gonna have, I mean, basically the way that most people code AVMs is in a very objective oriented way, right? I have an agent, I call an agent step, an agent has attributes, while here, like if you want to be computationally efficient, we advocate for the opposite. You want to write tensorized uh, things. And you're probably going to have to rethink how the model uh, works. But in my experience, it wasn't too difficult, especially for epidemiology, for which synchronicity is not a problem. So in the way that like how agents evolve, it's, it's very uh, synchronous. There's, there's not time conflicts between them. So 
Um, I think for epidemiology is quite relatively easy to do. Um, but yeah, I think ideally we would like to work on general tools just to transform non-differentiable to differentiable models, but yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? This is a really naive question. Um, all the results, results you sh showed were fitting to just, just cases or just deaths. Does this approach kind of scale to fitting to multiple data sources at the same time? Yeah, so, um, wait, so your question is like, how does this scale? When so it so you're trying to kind of jointly explain, say, hospitalizations, cases, deaths with the same model. Yeah, so right now I'm only focusing on cases because I. that's, that's going to be a, a problem that we have to work on because when we truncate the gradient information, let's say when you have when you have something happen at time step five, and then you measure it at time step 20, like a death, when you truncate the gradient, you're gonna lose that information. But I, th well, I think there are ways to work around that. But for now, I'm just, I'm just uh, fitting it to cases. But it will scale very well with um, like number of outputs just because of how the pipeline is set up in variational inference, right? So. Any other questions? Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, this is a just a pretty basic question, I think. But you said that you're using the L2 pen, um, loss. Sorry, I was just wondering if there was kind of like a reason why L2 was picked, and if this were to be available as a tool for others to use, whether or not another pe penalty could be picked instead. Yeah. So yeah. So there, there are many papers on what loss you should use for that to make it robust. Um, so we've and it really depends on the ABM you have and the output you have. Uh, for other ABMs, like economical ABMs, we, 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 we've seen that the MMD loss, the mean, minimum mean discrepancy, is, is much better than the L2 loss because it's capped. So then it's, it's way less sensible to outliers. But for this case, what I take is I take the time series of, of cases, then I take the log of that, and then I take the L2 loss in log space. And that's quite critical because if you don't do that, uh, you're weighting the cases at later times much more. So the, the log kind of makes it scale invariant. So I think like a good choice of loss, the, the good choice of loss should be something that you know it, it, it protects you against an outlier basically firing the loss, and also trying to be scale invariant when you're co when you're comparing at different scales, different things. But yeah, I don't have like a definite answer. But those are some guiding guiding principles. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thanks. Um, so, uh, have you thought about how, how it would work where your um, number of agents is changing? So, you know, f for example, you know, you're, you're bringing people in and out of the population. Is, ah, how, how are they changing? The, no, if if the, the number of agents yeah. is changing, uh, <clears throat> can you cope with that? Or does, does the method cope? Uh, yeah, I, I don't see why it shouldn't work. Like, like for instance, the uh, people who like Twitter, for instance, uses graph neural networks to predict uh, tweet engagement. So they have okay, but, nodes know, and edges that disappear and it's not a problem. Yeah, but the, with those guys, when the actual structure of the graph changes, you can't, um, can't batch your um, calculations anymore. In other words, to ah, you mean the like GPU. if a node appears, the process for node appearing is not differentiable? Or? Uh, yeah, essentially, yeah. Um, so I don't have a, I don't I don't know because I don't, I haven't had that problem of I think there are ways to go around that because um, again people on Twitter they do inference on graph neural networks in which the appearance of an edge means that the user engaged with another user and they're able to train on that so another way to do it for instance would be and and, and for me if I think it this way it's clear that it's differentiable is that the edge could be there you just have a weight of zero and then it changes the weight to one, and that process is differentiable. So there are ways, I think, around to make that process work with changing very number of agents and interactions, I think. But I don't have any proof. Okay. <laughs> I was just wondering, uh, so, I mean, you demonstrated that gradients are, are, are useful, but do you know how useful they are? In terms of, you know, if you were to do inference without using gradient information, would it still have worked and would it have been so, more efficient? Yeah. So, for instance, um, 
it, we haven't done a proper comparison, right? Uh, because the comparison I'm doing was with the previous June model that was not tensorized, and I'm comparing time, not model evaluations. But to give you an idea, the way we calibrated the original June model was doing history matching and Bayesian emulation. And to train the Gaussian process emulator, we needed like, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000 runs, right? And it was still not, the inference was still not as, as close to that. For this one, um, to, to, we, we, for, the June, for this June thing, we hit conversions after around 5,000 model evaluations. So it's comparable. But we, you don't, we don't need to train any Gaussian emulation or something like that. Now, for other models that we've checked, economical models, we, ha we can make comparisons on how people do simulation-based inference with normalizing flows, like, like Jonas talked. Now, this, again, is not because you, you have to basically train a normalizing flow as a surrogate model, but these ones typically require 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 model evaluations, and we find that with 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, we've hit it. Now, I think the real gain will be when we go to high dimension parameter space, right? Because that's where the gradient will save you. Because if you think about the intuition between Hamiltonian and Monte Carlo and things like that. So. Yeah, I agree. But I guess that I worry about trying to do inference when you've got 30 or, you know, more parameters for these big models anyway, because you yeah. run into identifiability issues. But yeah, 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 yeah. You need the data or like, yeah, a lot. Yeah. Any more questions from the room? We have one online. Are there agent-based models for which this approach wouldn't work? So maybe, and I mean to look for them. Um, so I think there are ones that you have to be uh, more careful than others. So for instance, if you have like a sugar escape model, for instance, in which the agent goes to where the sugar is, there's some Function, there's some movements that are, will be very intrinsic non-differentiable, like for instance, the agent looks around and takes an arc max of where it needs to go. That function will, very, will be will be very non-differentiable, but we can find maybe some relaxation of the model that uh, makes it differentiable. What I worry maybe is, for instance, like in economical simulation, economic simulations where you have, for instance, like market clearing mechanisms, in which the order at which you execute actions matters a lot that's going to be complicated to make it differentiable. And when you have uh, processes that are asynchronous across agents, that's going to be tough. But again, I'm in the look for them. I'm trying to like see where the limits of this scope are. And so far, I haven't found an ABM that I can say for sure it's not differentiable. Thank you. So let's join into a round of applause for Arno.